Welcome to our lecture on alcohols. Okay, so we're going to talk about alcohols. Um, we'll talk about some of the properties. And then we'll talk about the synthesis of alcohols. And in your synthesis of alcohols, we'll work our Pogel 15 exercise, which is oxidation reduction, and uh, Pogel 14. Pogel 14 and 15. And then we'll do 16A and 16B. And this will focus on reactions of alcohols. So all of these Pogels have something to do with alcohols. OK, so the alcohol is, um, we'll look at this alcohol here. And look at something like this. So we'll, we'll just do a few examples of naming and talk about the properties of alcohol. So alcohols are a carbon bonded to an OH. And this carbon is an sp3 carbon. Now, the types of intermolecular forces that an alcohol will undergo is hydrogen bonding. So they have a pretty high melting point and boiling points. To name an alcohol, um, it has a higher priority than what we've seen in the past with alkyl halides. So it would have a higher priority than um, the carbon halogen. And it would have a higher priority than the alkene. So to name this, we would have to give this alcohol the um, lowest number. So you would start the chain 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And 6 is hexane. So we'll drop the A and E and add E and E. And so that is carbon number 3. So this is hex 3-ene. And then we have um, dash, well, hex 3-en. A lot of times you don't even draw, and then you drop the E, and then you write 2-ol, hex 3-ene, 2-ol. And then you have a substituent on 5, so then it's 5-bromo, hex 3-ene, 2-ol. And that is how you would name um, an, an alcohol. This is an allylic alcohol. So not just a secondary alcohol, the allylic secondary alcohol. So uh, when I do secondary, I'm classifying this alcohol. So when I classify the alcohol, it kind of lets me know how it's going to react. So I look at the, in this case, I look at the carbon that's bonded to the OH, and I say, how many carbons is this carbon bonded to? And that's the question I ask when I classify. And I see that carbon is bonded to 1, 2. So that makes it a secondary alcohol. And you have to have the double bond next to it, which is an sp2, sp2 carbon. So that makes it an allylic secondary alcohol. So those are ways to describe and classify the alcohol structures. Here we have a um, cyclohexane. Hexane. And we have a methyl. And we would want to start with, this is carbon number one, because we want to give the lowest number to the alcohol. And then we'd have to go counterclockwise. So one, two, three, four, five, six. So you have a two. Um, and you could write trans. So um, a two methyl cyclo hex dash one all and that would name that compound um, 
You could also um, add R and S on this. So here you have um, this oxygen here, and that would get number one priority. Uh, what's you don't see here the hydrogen coming at you, so that would be number four, and then this carbon here, the methane, would be number two. This would be number three. So if you connect your one, two, three, that is S, but then it would be R. So that's one R because you do this with your roux. And then you do the same here. You have a carbon, 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 which you don't see the hydrogen going back, which is four. So you have um, this carbon would be number one. This carbon would be number two. This would be number three. And then that would be R. So 1R, 2R. And then you put that in parentheses before the name. So you can practice some naming of alcohols. Um, we're not going to go over your POGL that talks about diols. Um, but I will just give you an example of a naming of a diol. Um, so you have something like Something like this here, you find your longest chain, one, two, three, four, and so this would be um, butane, drop the E, or you could keep the E, uh, dash one, two, diol. And that would be how you'd name a diol. Um, if you have an aromatic group attached, like this um, to an alcohol. This is called a phenol. And so if you have an OH and a BR here, this would be um, two bromo phenol. And we'll talk about aromatic compounds later on. Okay, so we've talked about how this. Um, OH group can do intermolecular hydrogen bonding. So a hydrogen bond might look like that. And those hydrogen bonds require more energy to break. So they have higher uh, melting points and higher boiling points than your um, than ketones and aldehydes which have just dipole-dipole interactions. We also have higher melting boiling points. So alcohols have higher melting points and boiling points than um, your alkanes, your alkenes, your alkynes, and higher than your alkyl halides. And these here only have van der Waals. Um, they're also um, typically, uh, if you have about six carbons or less, they're going to be uh, miscible in water. And that means soluble in water. So, and that's because like dissolves like, and water can do a hydrogen bonding with. Um, with the alcohol function here. And let's just make sure we do this right. It's the actual hydrogen bond is between the oxygen and the hydrogen here. Hydrogen bonding can happen. You have to have a hydrogen. And then it's basically oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine. And you're really going to see it more in your oxygen and nitrogens because those are your functional groups. Um, now, acidity of alcohols. So let's talk about that. So alcohols, what's the acidity? We've been talking about acid-base chemistry. So this is propanol. Okay, so if you don't have a number there, you can assume it's on carbon number one. And um, if you had sodium hydroxide here, which you know is a strong base, what would the what would your products be 
This is what you have to be able to do, right? Acid-base chemistry. Um, and, and what's the equilibrium? So is it going to be equal? Is it going to be towards the starting material? Or is it going to be towards the products? So what's going to be the equilibrium? So we need to know pK values. So let's do some acid-base chemistry here. So here's your sodium hydroxide, which is your base. We'll label that as base. And we take the acidic proton. So in this case, this is your acid. What's the pKa? Um, alcohols are 16 to 18. OK, pKa. So a terbutyl of ranch would be a pKa of like 18, which is less acidic. Remember, you're lower your pKa value, the more acidic. So the propanol is going to be more acidic, so it's pKa of around 16. And then what's our product here? You see how we drew our electron flow arrows? And so you got the O minus, and the sodium is going to hang out with the negative charge. And then this hydrogen here is now part of water. And that's what the electron flow arrows mean. So now the water is your conjugate acid because that's where the green hydrogen went. And this would be your conjugate base. And then we assign pKa values to our acid and our conjugate acid. We don't assign pKa values to anything else. So then pKa value, we already said, is 16. What's the pKa value of water? 15.7. So 16 and 15.7, your equilibrium arrows will be equal. And so that's the acidity of just a regular alcohol. Let's look at if you have a phenol. Okay, so a phenol, um, and we put this with sodium hydroxide. Now you're looking at a phenol acid, pKa is about 10. Okay, so now when we draw our products, And so why is it lower? And how much lower is it? What does that 10 mean? OK, so a pK of 10 versus 16 is six zeros. OK, that's how much 100, so a million times lower. It's a million times more acidic. So one, you say one million times more acidic than propanol, propanol, okay? So phenol is a million times more acidic than propanol. Now, this is our pKa for our conjugate acid, because this is our acidic proton here, and that is 15.7. This is our conjugate base. We don't really care about that. Our base, we don't really care about it. So what we do care about is comparing this number here of 10 with this number of 15.7. The equilibrium value always goes towards, so the equilibrium for acid-base reactions always lie toward your higher pK value, which is your weaker acid. So you need to be able to write acid-base reactions um, using alcohols. And we did a lot of that in our, um, uh, we did a lot of that in Organic One. Okay, so um, how do we form bases? So we've also, so we've talked about the acidity of alcohols. Um, we've talked about its hydrogen bonding, but we also know that alcohols form alkoxides. Okay, and these are strong bases. They've also been strong nucleophiles. 
we've seen uh, alkoxide. So let's look at an alkoxide. We'll look at this alkoxide. And we'll look at this alkoxide. Okay, so what you do, sodium is a great, just a, a metal. And you put sodium in, um, sodium is like a, almost like slicing butter. You have to be careful not to get it in the air, but it's really soft and silvery. And you put this in a solution of phenol. The alcohol is liquid. And what happens is you're going to get this reaction. And then hydrogen will form hydrogen gas. Okay, and that will bubble out. So it will bubble out of your reaction. Um, if you wanted to think about this as a pKa value, you can just basically, this is going to go straight to products. Um, conjugate acid here, pKa is um, 10. And the pKa of hydrogen gas is uh, 35. So it's going to go 25 zeros. Um, towards the products. 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, 21, 24. So this is how much times it's going to be over here on the product side. And this is called a phenoxide. Okay, and it would be a strong base and a strong nucleophile because it has a negative charge on the oxygen. Same thing here. How would you make this? You would throw in some sodium metal and you would get essentially an acid-base reaction where hydrogen gas and this would be a propen oxide um, and we just call that an alkoxide because it's an oxide ide meaning negative charge of an alkane okay and those are strong bases Okay, so um, we're just talking about a little bit of properties, and now I think we're ready to go into the synthesis. So the reactions that you need to have for your um, synthesis of alcohols is what we want to make a list of first. Okay, so in your book you have some nice reviews here. Um, how to go from an alkene to the synthesis of alcohols. You have three ways to make an alkene to an alcohol. Okay, so I'm not going to do a lot of review. You can always go back and review that. But um, you have, remember you have Makovnikov. And you have the anti Makovnikov. So here um, we did this one here. And well, if you did sulfuric acid and water, then you're going to have to draw your um, pronation first and your carbocation. Um, and do you have to always worry about rearrangement with sulfuric acid? So a lot of times you're not going to want to do that. And it's also very harsh. But here's the alcohol product. If you take another alkene and you use mercury acetate in a solution of water, which is the first reagent, and then you treat it with sodium borhyde, you're going to give your Makovnikov alcohol here. And remember that goes through the intermediate mercurium ion, curium ion, and then that delta positive here will bring the water in. And you get opening. Um, okay, so that's your mercury. And then the anti Makovnikov would be what reagent? And you will have to know all of these and do all these. Um, the borane 
and then you treat it with hydrogen peroxide and a basic solution, sodium hydroxide. And this time you get hydrogen added and the OH at the same side. And that's the anti Markovnikov product. Okay, so that's how you go from alkenes. Um, what about alkanes? Okay, so alkanes, well, if you have a, a bromine, a leaving group, okay, this is a primary alkyl halide. You treat it with like maybe sodium hydroxide. This is going to go SN2. So and counter carbon, one, two, three. So that is a primary alcohol. Uh, classify these up here. This is this carbon to the OH. If you classify it, it's bonded to three carbons. That's a tertiary alcohol. This carbon is also a tertiary alcohol. I always classify my alcohols. Uh, this is a secondary alcohol. This is a primary alcohol. Okay, so that's an SN2 reaction that works well. Um, and we've talked about alkenes, and then we did a reaction with alkynes. So our alkynes would be something like this. So you remember if you had a terminal alkyne, you could treat it with sodium amide, which is a, a base. And then that gives you the sodium alkanide, sodium alkyne, ide, ide because it's a negative charge. And then you can react that with a carbonyl, a ketone. And this comes here, opens up. And so you make your tetrahedral intermediate. And you make a carbon-carbon bond. And then you treat that with a little bit of acid and an aqueous workup. And that will give you your alcohol. So that is another way to make alcohols. And that's called an alkyne all. So, OK, so we also want to talk about the organic organometallic reagents for alcohol synthesis and and then we'll talk about oxidation reduction actually I'll tell you what we're going to do this lecture we'll do organometallic reagents and then we'll work Pogel 14 and then we'll do another session for Pogel 15 so let's talk about organometallic reagents Okay, so organometallic reagents um, contain covalent bonds between a carbon and a metal. So let's look at the electronegativities of our first few groups. So if you have lithium, it has an electronegativity of 1, sodium has a 0.9, potassium 0.8. Magnesium is in your second uh, group and is 1.3. Aluminum 1.6 and then carbon is a 2.5. So if you have um, so an organometallic would be like usually it's a carbon um, lithium bond or you're going to see a carbon magnesium bond. So if you have something like um, methyl. Um, Grignard, okay, so you're going to get um, something like this, and you're going to get it, and you're going to get two of them. So, how does that form? What reaction would you do on this? Um, you basically will take a um, 
a methyl bromide or some kind of alkyl halide. So you have an alkyl halide and you would put this in magnesium. And the magnesium would be in an ether solution. This is very important for ether because these are flammable and will catch fire. Magnesium actually inserts. Now magnesium is in um, group two. Okay, so it likes a plus two charge. So it's going to insert inside here and you're gonna get a carbon and it's gonna be partially covalent with magnesium and bromide, okay? But you can go ahead and pretty much say this is very positive, this makes a negative carbon. Now we've seen carbon typically is positive. So this is this is unusual and this is called an umpolong. Okay, so that is my word, umpolong. And we've also seen negative carbons and this can be important. Um, your nitriles is a negative carbon. So like potassium nitriles been a negative carbon and then an alkyne is a negative carbon. And these are very powerful when you're doing synthesis. And now we have organometallics and they're going to give you a negative carbon. So here we have this um, Grignard. Now they can do the same thing that our alkynes and our um, nitriles did. So now you can react this with like an acetone, a carbonyl. A carbonyl has a nice delta positive carbon so you have an, a, a strong dipole so this is very um, electronically driven so th basically these electrons here are going to go towards this carbon the positive carbon and those electrons are going to go towards the oxygen so this is a reaction mechanism you need to be able to draw now we get this in your reaction sheets And then you get your tetrahedral intermediate. So this is your tetrahedral intermediate between this carbon and this carbon here. And then this goes up to make a negative. And you can put this in brackets. This is your tetrahedral intermediate. I always want to see that. I want to see it in your Pogel exercises and your open responses. And then you always treat this with a little bit of acid water. You would do this in your separatory funnel. It's called a workup. And what happens then is it protonates. It protonates right there. And this is your alcohol. What's the name of that alcohol? One, two, three. So it's on two. So two methyl, two propan all, or two methyl propan two all. Okay. Also, um, what is this classification? This would be a tertiary alcohol. Okay, so there's, um, this is called a Grignard. Okay, for Dr. Grignard, who got a Nobel Prize for being able to make negative carbons. This has been very positive, um, influential for synthesis. Okay, what about if you had the carbon with a lithium? So if you treat this with lithium, lithium is in group one, so it's only a plus one. So you're going to have to use um, basically two equivalents, okay? And, you, and so then you get CH3 lithium. This is very delta positive. This is delta minus. Um, I even sometimes go positive, negative whenever I see a metal. I just go ahead and make that because I want to know that that's a strong nucleophile. And then you're going to get lithium bromide. And so you see you have to have two lithiums here. Um, 
so you too. Um, let's see real quick. Yeah, you need two lithiums. <laughs> Not two of these, see? Balancing equations. We don't worry about this too much in organic. You just kind of throw it in there. So two lithiums. So you got two lithiums. Um, so, but that's the balanced equation. And you need to do this once again. Um, you can do this in hexanes. But I always just go with THF, which is tetrahydrofuran. Or just diethyl ether. But you can also do this in hexanes. You can't do um, Grignard's in hexanes. You're definitely going to have to have ether. And you cannot not ever, never, not ever do these in alcohol. Okay? And let me show you why you can't do these in alcohol. Because let's say you make your compound here. Okay? So you've made your um, organolithium or your organometal compound and you are trying to do this in ethanol solvent okay well what's going to happen here is let's make that a full positive that's a negative and the negative is going to act as an acid base okay so we won't for acid base, we won't put our equilibrium arrows in yet. Okay, so then what happens is the CH3 will take that acidic proton and you get a lithium alkoxide. Okay, this is a lithium alkoxide, and we just, just talked about that. That is a strong base. That's a very strong base and a strong nucleophile. Let's do our pKa values. Okay, so what's the, if this is your base, this is your acid, we sign a pKa value to the alcohol. We said that that has a pKa of 16. And then we do a pKa of our conjugate acid. So there's our hydrogen. So there's your conjugate acid. What's the pKa of alkanes? This is an sp3 carbon hydrogen bond. It's 50, okay? What's the difference between 50 and 16? 34. 34 zeros, okay? That's how far to the product this would be by 34 zeros. So the problem is you would be, it's called quenching. You would be quenching your Grignard or your organometallic, okay? In this case, it would be quenching your organometallic. Once you have a methane, it's a dud. It's not going to do anything. You have no polarization there. And remember, what did you want? You wanted to make a negative carbon. You wanted to make your organolithium. And you wanted to do that because you probably wanted to react it with a ketone. Okay, so let's react. You probably wanted to take this organolithium and react it with a ketone. So here's positive. This is negative. Show your delta positive and delta negative here. Okay, so the reaction mechanism here would be a tetrahedral intermediate. Here's your CH3 that just came in. And then here's your alcohol. Does that have four things on it? Look at that carbon. This carbon right here. Does that have four things? One, two, three, four. Yes, it's your tetrahedral intermediate. And now you treat it with some acid and you get a tertiary alcohol. You started with a ketone. So if I were you and I was making my reaction sheets, I would have my starting material as a ketone. And I would show, draw that ketone. My reagents are an organometallic. So you can do this with a Grignard or a lithium, organolithium. And you want to use maybe some THF solvent, an ether solvent. You can write your product then as an alcohol. And you can say it's a tertiary alcohol. Okay. 
ketones will make tertiary alcohols. And then your notes, stereochemistry, you want to say that you have a tetrahedral intermediate because I want to see those tetrahedral intermediates. Now, if you um, react this to a, um, what if you react this Grignard or organolithium with an aldehyde? Okay, so here's an aldehyde. One, two, three, four. This is called butan al aldehyde. Okay, so you react this with this. You make plus minus. Here's your delta positive delta minus, so you have these electrons here going there. You've got to make your tetrahedral intermediate. And then you have a hydrogen here and a CH3. So you see here you have four things. The CH3 has added. You already have a hydrogen. You have your oxygen sigma bond that remains. And then you have your carbon chain. So there's your four. That's a tetrahedral intermediate. Okay, so I would write, show this on another reaction sheet for your own sake. And then you treat this with a little bit of acid. And you get okay, what is this? One, two, three, four, five. Five, that's two, pen, tan, all. So you can put the two there, or you could write pen, tan, dash, two, all. Both of those are acceptable. And what kind of alcohol is this? Let's classify it. Well, that carbon is bonded to two carbons, so that's a secondary alcohol. So when you're writing here, okay, so if you take your starting material here as an aldehyde, and you react this methyl lithium, your product is going to be a secondary alcohol. Okay, so an aldehyde will give you a secondary alcohol, a ketone is going to give you a tertiary alcohol, and you're always going to have the tetrahedral intermediate for each one of these. Okay, I think at this point we are ready for POGOL 14 exercise, organometallic reagents. So let's start with that. Okay, so for your POGOL um, so we're doing POGOL activity 14 and these are called organometallic reagents. And that's with two L's. Okay, so first our model one it's about how to prepare Grignard and organolithium reagents. And the model here uses R's. You start with an alkyl halide, alkyl or hydrogen. And you can react it with whichever metal, magnesium or lithium. And magnesium's two plus bromide. So we have to have conservation of charge. Okay, so let's look at question one. What metal reacts with the alkyl halide to form the organolithium? So this is your organolithium, and it's asking what metal. So do you see the lithium metal? Okay. Um, B, what is the charge of lithium ion? Okay, so lithium, the charge of lithium ion, the ion is a charged particle, and so it would be a plus one. What metal is reacted with alkyl halide to form the Grignard? So what metal is it's magnesium? Because this is your Grignard over here. Because that's 
what Mr. Dr. Grenyard came up with. And what is the charge of the magnesium ion? Well, it's in group two, so magnesium is a two plus. What is the charge of bromide? The bromide is group seven, so it's going to be a minus one. Excuse me. Okay, number two A. Consider the bond between carbon and the metal. Based on the electronegativity values, carbon is 2.5, magnesium 1.3, lithium is 1.0. Put a delta positive and delta negative signs on the carbon and the metal, both organometallic reagents, the model one, to indicate the polarization. So over here, this lithium would be the positive, and your carbon would be the negative. Over here, magnesium would be your positive, and your carbon would be the negative. Okay, the carbon of the carbon metal bond, the organometallic reagent, is partially positive or partially negative. The carbon is partially negative. Okay, so it's partially negative because carbon's electronegativity is 2.5, whereas the metal is 1 or 1.3, so the electronegativity difference um, would be um, less than, carbon's less than, so it would be uh, gain the negative electrons. Add curved arrows to the organometallic reagents in model one to show the electrons could move to break the bonds between the carbon and metal. Draw the resulting ionic compound above. And um, for those of you that are new to the course, I always want um, electron flow arrows when I'm grading any kind of pogol or any kind of open response. Um, draw the resulting ionic compounds above. Okay, so the, the least do insertion, so you're not going to draw. It's actually when you're doing oxidation reduction, you don't draw electron flow arrows. But here, you would want to show that these electrons are going to go here. And then here, you want to show that the electrons are going to go there. So that would be the electron flow arrows that um, you could draw. Okay, number three. Would a carbon of an organometallic reagent act as a nucleophile base or an electrophile acid? Explain. Well, obviously, it's negative, right? So if a carbon is negative, it's going to act as a nucleophile. And that's why we do nucleophile like that, nucleophile, because it has a basically a lone pair, and it pretty much has a negative charge. So these are going to be strong nucleophiles or strong bases, depending on um, reaction conditions. Now we're on model two. Okay, so for model two, we have model three and four, and then we have additional problems. Okay, so model two. This is the Grignard reagent reacting with an alcohol. And we've done an example of that. And you'll see that it will act as a strong base. So we're going to draw, this is methanol, and it acts as a strong base to make an alkane. So you might even want to write a reaction sheet for that. All right, so 4A. Draw curved arrows to show the electron movement for the reaction. Okay, so here, when we see magnesium, you can go ahead and make that a positive. That makes the um, R negative, so this is going to act as a base. And those electrons here are going to go after the hydrogen there. And then those electrons will go to the oxygen. And so this hydrogen now bonds... Those two electrons here have bonded to this hydrogen, and then those electrons have 
now are forming this, which I wouldn't even write that like that because that's not going to be the case. It's going to be electronegative. It's going to be an electrostatic bond. Okay, so it's not going to be a covalent bond. So I would disagree with how that's presented. Uh, what is the role of the Grignard? It's the base, you see? It's the base because it accepted the proton. What is the role of the methanol? Methanol is going to be your acid because it donated the proton. And if you do the pKa for the alcohol here, it's 16. And the pKa, so this is your conjugate acid, your pKa is going to be 50. We don't care about the conjugate base pKa. So the two numbers you're comparing is the 16 and the 50. So it's going to be very much towards the product. All right, so 4D. The pKa of carbon anions is around 50, okay? So that's what they're talking about here, 50. Estimate the pKa value of the alcohol and predict whether the reaction would proceed in the forward direction. So basically what we just did, and you can see that it would proceed in the forward direction by what's 50 minus 16? 34 zeros. So I am not going to draw all these zeros, but I think you get the point. Um, so yes, in the forward direction. Draw the product expected on the reaction of a Grignard with water. <laughs> so now if you have a Grignard with water. So if you put this in water, which you never want to do, okay, it's actually explosive because it's so energetic. So here's your negative. So those electrons are going to take that hydrogen and you're going to get RH, which is an alkane, pK of 50, and then you're going to get your magnesium bromide and your um, hydroxide. So here's your um, acid. Acids are all, he's on the reactant side, pK 15.7, and your alkane's 50. So it's going to go very far to the right. And you won't have a Grignard anymore. So organometallic reagents are usually prepared from alkyl halides used directly without isolating the reactive agent. Discussing your groups, why is it important that alcohols and water not be present when preparing your organometallic? Because the alcohols and water have an acidic proton and this acidic proton will quench, basically turn off, make it a dud, your um, Grignard or your alkyl um, organometallic reagent. Let's go to model three. Model three is the addition of an organometallic reagent to, so we're doing organo, metallic reagents to aldehydes and ketones. Now this is something you want to be able to do and we've talked about this and you can add it to your reactant sheets but um, they're going to also make some ketones. We've talked about what's the product going to be? Tertiary alcohols and aldehydes are going to make secondary alcohols. So this is a way to make alcohols when you take these organometallic reagents and you react them to aldehydes and ketones. And that's what we're discussing. We're discussing um, how to make alcohols because we're talking about alcohols in these next couple of chapters. All right, so you can start answering those questions on your POGL. and then you treat this with HCl, and you get your alcohol here. Notice that they also do the tetrahedral intermediate, which is this right here. Okay, I'll write tetrahedral intermediate. So you want to have these in your reaction sheets. All right, question number five. Draw the delta positive and delta negative on the aldehyde to show the polarity. So this is your aldehyde. 
It has a carbonyl with a hydrogen. So your delta positive is this carbon, and your delta negative would be the oxygen. Indicate which reagent is the nucleophile. Okay, your nucleophile has your lone pair negative charge. This is your nucleophile. And which is the electrophile? The aldehyde is the electrophile. That's how I write my electrophile because it either has to have a positive charge or it has to have an empty, unhybridized p orbital. What new bond is formed in the first step? Okay, so let's look. We have this CH3 here, and we have that bond there on the carbon. So the new bond is between the organometallic carbon to the carbonyl carbon of the aldehyde. Okay, so a carbon-carbon bond. After acidification in the second step, so you see your HCl, what is the functional group of the final product? So this functional group is an alcohol. And let's go ahead and classify it. That OH carbon is bonded to two carbons. So the R is a carbon just any old carbon, okay? And then you have this carbon. So that's a secondary alcohol. Draw curved arrows to show electron movement in this reaction. Okay, so you always go, always draw your electron flow arrows from the nucleophile to the electrophile. So that's why it's very important for you to identify nucleophile and electrophile. It's gonna come in to this carbon, and then these electrons have to go up towards the oxygen. And so that's what you see here, the negative oxygen, and you also see this new bond being formed. And that is where the electrons went to form a tetrahedral intermediate. Draw the, and then these electrons go and take the HCl to get protonated. Draw the product expected for the reaction of each of the following compounds with the organometallic reagents. Okay, so let's draw these. The first one is formaldehyde. And you're using a methyl Grignard. And then notice you do step one, step two. That's important. You can't do it all together. You gotta show that it's in step one, step two. Okay, whenever I see my metal, I make that a positive. So I make this carbon a negative. Now I've identified my strong nucleophile. And then in my because you always have to have a nucleophile electrophile, okay? So there's my nucleophile, and I'm looking at my electrophile here, and I'm going to put my polar, my delta positive, so now I can go straight here, and then I'm going to show my tetrahedral intermediate. Okay, I'm not going to worry about the magnesium. This is all I'm going to ask you for is the major organic product. Okay, and now we have the H3O plus, and I think it's really important for you to draw the um, Lewis structures out so you can show the bonds being broken. And so, we'll write, let's write tetrahedral intermediate, especially when you're learning, you call things by their names. It really helps you retain. And then you have that. And then you want to classify this. This is a sec well, this is a primary alcohol, folks. So how is that a primary alcohol? Okay, so this carbon is bonded to this oxygen. It's bonded to how many carbons? Just one. So primary alcohol. So this is formaldehyde. Formaldehyde is what they use to embalm bodies and dead animals and preserve. Notice that carbon here has two hydrogens. So it's like a double aldehyde. Okay, and that's how you get a primary alcohol. All right. And so you might want to, I know students in the past, if they 
kind of learn that a Grignard or organometallic reagents to a formaldehyde is going to give you a primary alcohol. That's kind of what we're doing here. Um, and you might want to list this on your sheet because this is an aldehyde. And now we're going to learn that this is going to make a secondary alcohol. And this is helpful when you get a product and you have to say, okay, what is it going to take to make a secondary alcohol? And then you're like, oh, okay, I need an aldehyde. So that makes it kind of helpful. So notice I've identified my nucleophile. And then I'm going to come over here and identify my electrophile and really find where carbon is going to pull those electrons. And then I show my electron flow arrows. I'm going to draw in my tetrahedral intermediate. Okay. And then I'm going to protonate this with my acid. Okay. And so those electrons will take that. And then I have made a secondary alcohol. And you can see because this carbon bonded to this oxygen is bonded to two carbons. So that makes it a secondary alcohol. And the next one is a ketone. Okay, so these R groups. And if you don't like the R groups, you could just make those methyl. Okay, so here we have a phenyl magnesium granule. So let's draw that out. So just because you're giving it like that doesn't mean you shouldn't draw out the Lewis structures. So here's your positive. This is your negative. This is going to be your nucleophile. And then this is your electrophile. There's your delta positive. There's your delta minus. The electrons are going to go from this carbon to that carbon. We're going to form a tetrahedral intermediate. So we've got R carbon, negative R, and then we have our phenyl. And so it is this carbon here. It's that carbon here that has made that bond to the carbon. And then you treat it with acid. And you're going to get a tertiary alcohol. Okay, so when you do this with ketones, you get a tertiary alcohol. Identify the type, primary, secondary, or tertiary that is formed in the three reactions above. So we've done that. Um, ketones will always give, anytime you can say always, is pretty big deal in chemistry. Ketones will always give tertiary alcohols because you have two carbon groups attached to the carbonyl and you're adding a third carbon from the um, Grignard. Based on sterics effects alone, discuss which would be more susceptible to a reaction with a nucleophile, an aldehyde or a ketone. Okay, so if we ever wanted our reactions to go faster in um, synthesis, we would choose an aldehyde over a ketone. And because I did this so often, I knew that this is about four zeros faster. Okay, so it's about 10,000 times faster. Okay, so aldehydes will react 10,000 times faster than ketones. So it's pretty fast. If we wanted to slow our reaction down, we would choose a ketone. So, um, and it's because of the sterics. I mean, you got this methyl group, and it's basically, especially when it's big and bulky, it's going to knock that nucleophile from coming in. Based on electronic effects, discuss which would be more susceptible. An aldehyde would be um, faster as well because um, these R groups are electron donating groups. So R groups are electron. So your methyl or electron donating groups, and they, when they donate their electrons, what they're doing through a sigma, it's an inductive thing, they're putting electrons towards this carbon, and that makes it not as positive. Hydrogen is not electron donating. So when you have a ketone, you've got electron donation going 
two ways. So that's why aldehydes are 10,000 times faster. So if you have an aldehyde and a ketone with a nucleophile, the nucleophile is going to go after the aldehyde 10,000 times faster. Now we are on model four. So let's do model four and then you can do your additional questions for credit. So model four, now we're doing addition of organo metallic reagents to acid halides and esters. I would recommend you do another reaction sheet just for acid halides and esters. Drawing. Okay, so question number seven for the reaction shown in model four. In the first step, label the reagents as nucleophile and electrophile. What is the product form in the first step? Okay, so in the first step here, this is step one. Um, here's your nu nucleophile. You see your negative charge? So there's your nucleophile, and here's your electrophile. And so there's your delta positive and delta minus. And what is the product? What is this product? What's the functional group? This is a ketone. Okay, there's a ketone. And notice we started with either an acid halide or an ester. So what's that look like? An acid halide has like a Cl over here. Or an ester looks like this. Okay, so there's your ester. Um, is the product formed after the first step isolated? What's this say? Not isolated. So no. In the second step, label the reagents as nucleophile and electrophile. All right, so once again, this is our nucleophile. You see the negative charge. And now this is our electrophile. So this is your second step, and that's the second equivalent. So you're adding two equivalents. What bond is formed in the second step? So we have this carbon, and we have another carbon. Um, so it's the carbon-carbon bond. What is how many equivalents of organolithium reagents for the whole reaction? So first and second. So two equivalents. What is the final product form in model four? This is an alcohol and it is a tertiary alcohol. Okay, we classify our alcohols, tertiary alcohol. 8A, it has been found that the first step in the mechanism of addition to an acid halide or an ester involves a tetrahedral intermediate. Carbon has four single bonds. Draw the tetrahedral intermediate expected after the reaction of organolithium with an acid chloride. And this is a mechanism you want to add to your charts, and you will have to be able to draw this mechanism. Okay, so let's draw this. So a lot of times you would see this like this, and let's just go ahead and add a carbon. Okay, so we'll make this, this is your acid chloride. 
Okay, so then we make this a plus, we make this a negative, this is our nucleophile, and we recognize our electrophile here. Okay, so this is our electrophile. And we draw our electrons there, and we got to show our tetrahedral intermediate. This is connected to a chlorine, and then we can write this in blue so we know we just added this. Okay, so this is our tetrahedral intermediate. You should be writing this down. Okay, now, this is not what we've isolated, and that's because the CL is a great leaving group. Okay, so that's what these all have in common. All these X groups are great leaving groups. So what happens is this carbonyl will reform and the chlorine will leave. The driving force is like sleigh riding downhill. Reforming the carbonyl bond is so energetically favorable. It's like going downhill. Okay, it will happen. You cannot stop it, folks. Okay, and so that's why you form this ketone. Okay, and the ketone reacts faster than your acid chlorides and your esters. Okay, and I think it might be like 10,000 times faster, and that's why it's not isolated. And even if you didn't put two equivalents in there, you get a mixture of um, product here, tertiary alcohol, and then you probably get to contamination of 20% of your ketone. So you do want excess um, organolithium whenever you're dealing with acid chlorides, acid bromides, or esters. So what does it say? Um, after formation of the tetrahedral intermediate, the X group leaves to form a ketone. Draw curved arrows to show this tetrahedral intermediate. So I've done that and I want you to be able to do that. After the addition of one equivalent organometallic reagent, a ketone is formed. Even if only one equivalent of the nucleophile is added, no ketone is isolated. And the reason why um, is because the ketone is going to react faster than your starting material. And so then the ketone is going to go all the way to the tertiary alcohol. So actually, from that, um, Pogel is saying the only thing you're going to have is 50% um, if you only add one equivalent, 50% alcohol tertiary alcohol and 50% of starting material. So you want to drive that to completion. Okay, so I'm looking at your additional questions on page 171 and 172. And I want to see, uh, you're supposed to design a synthesis for the target molecule. So you need to show all those reactions and electron flow arrows. And I want to see tetrahedral intermediates. And um, even if it doesn't ask for it, I want to see it in your drawing because I can give you feedback and these are worth, um, Pogel is not worth as much as exams. Number 12, I do want you to draw the steroid. I think it's good practice for you to draw these organo uh, compounds. And we'll stop there.